Now, Revelation. We're dealing with the church of Thyatira. And right now we want to deal in particular with the second chapter and the 24th verse. Now the last part of verse 23 the Apostle John writes under the inspiration of the Spirit, I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now for just a moment, we want you to think of that, what he said, I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Have you ever considered how a God of all grace deals with people according to their deeds. A lot of people have been somewhat confused over that. Now just for a moment, how that people deal with grace and yet God says, I will deal with you according to your deeds. Well, any time God does with deals with people according to their deeds they are people that have rejected the grace syndrome the grace cycle the grace government let me say that again because the first gift given to man was his free volition And free will was the first gift given to man. Now, because all of us have sinned and come short of God's glory, God had to bring in grace and truth. And after the finished work, although he always expressed grace from Genesis on, he brought every believer under a government of understanding grace. The grace would keep them from sinning. The grace would give them power over sin. The grace would give them illumination of doctrine. The grace would give them intimate fellowship with the person of Christ through the Spirit. But if a person did not want to grow in grace and knowledge and chooses to go the works route in the measure that we go the works route is the measure we are judged by works. This is why Luke 6, 37 says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Give mercy, and it shall be given unto you. Now, this whole thing is not teaching works. If you study Luke 37, you might think it's teaching works, but if you read 636b, be merciful just as your Father is merciful, then you'll understand God starts out with mercy, with the believer and always places him under the government of grace because mercy and truth met together and peace and God's righteousness kissed each other and truth sprung up from the earth Psalm 85 10 and 11 therefore we have a picture that if I refuse the only possibility I have to grow if I reject the only possibility I have to adjust, if I repudiate the privilege I have to recover and to walk in the light of the finished work, then by my words and my thoughts and my deeds, I am placed under a program of deeds until God can correct me. Therefore, 
God will give to us according to our deeds. And why does he do that? Be, to be fair to us, if that's the way we want it, that's the way it will be. In that case, he allows me to be judged in the measure that I judge to try to straighten out my judging people. He allows me to be condemned in the measure that I'm condemned, not by him, but by life. As far as he goes judicially, there is no condemnation. So there is an experiential plateau where God deals with us according to our deeds. Judicially, our sins are paid for forever. This is not to be taken as a system of works. It's simply to correct those that refuse grace. Now in the 80s, many, many preachers from all denominations were embarrassed when their sins were revealed after several decades. And we can be sure that almost in every case they were receiving penalty according to their own judgment or their deeds. They refused to grow in grace, to adjust to grace, so God allowed Luke 637 to come their way, hopefully to correct them. Now, verse 24 of Revelation 2. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you. Verse 25, only hold on to what you have until I come back at the second coming. Now, this particular passage deals First of all, we're going to quickly exegete it before we get in to the doctrine of the deep things of Satan. But unto you, human de lego is a present active indicative. He's speaking to the inward thoughts of their attitudes. He refers also to intelligent speech, speech that has been well thought through. Now what this means is there was a remnant in the church of Thyatira who produced the continuous action by self-discipline of being dogmatic about thinking things through with God. They thought things through very spiritually and they thought intelligently and they spoke intelligently. They were we don't know how many of them that they were, that there were there, but how many ever they were there, these people were now going to be addressed separately from the other people. Unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, those who have not been led astray by the Jezebel and her false doctrine, Doctrine here is didache, and it means instruction, teaching, and its content. So they have not been led away by the instruction, instruction and teaching and content of Satan's doctrines. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 29, Paul emphasizes the importance of teaching the doctrine of Jesus Christ to new believers. To those in Thyatira and which have not known. Now, Aris, active indicative of the word genosco, they have not experienced or interacted with Satan's doctrines. They have not known them. Then we have the depths of Satan. The depths of Satan is referenced to a view uh, held by the early Gnostics. They believe that by entering into the stronghold of Satan's believers could learn the limits of his power and thus overcome him. Now think of that for just a moment. They believe by getting into serious doctrines of Satan that they could learn his strongholds 
and learn the limits of his power and thus overcome it. So they studied what they call the deep things of Satan. They didn't enter into 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 12, the deep things of God. They also believed that a believer's spirituality was unaffected by what he did with his body. They said the body, what you do with your physical body, is irrelevant to spirituality. Anybody that says otherwise is legalistic. That's what they said. With this view in mind, Jezebel could argue that fornication was not sin if it was done to the glory of God in a religious expression of worship. Well, that's the principle. Of course, the commercial city of Corinth was consistently saturated with this type of uh, spiritual fornication as well as physical fornication. Now, so now we want you to see in the practical application of our day the deep things of Satan from our objective viewpoint. We know that that they uh, worshipped idols, that they had committed fornication, and so on. But some of the deep things of Satan, objectively, from divine viewpoint, is very vital and relevant and pertinent to this class. Now, the first thing we want you to see in the doctrine of the deep things of Satan is this. Satan started out with Eve and Adam by having them sow fig leaves. So therefore, they covered up their nakedness by fig leaves. Had nothing to do with the blood sacrifice, with an animal being killed. Cain brought the vegetables of the soil instead of the blood of a sacrifice. You see, right away we have Satan's counterfeits. Now, the fig leaves in themselves and the vegetables brought by Cain represented religion works. And they started out a process of the deep things of Satan. Now, Satan comes in with tremendous, unbelievable imitation. First, he counterfeited. People would kill people and think they were doing God a service later on in John 16, 2. That's the counterfeit of the angel of light. That was very deep. To kill people and believe with all your heart you were doing God a service. That was entering into the application of deception in the deep things of Satan. And Satan comes up with a pseudo-forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness where a person remembers and yet confesses forgiveness. Forgiveness must not be exercised because of works. Forgiveness must be exercised as the Holy Spirit works in us through the word. Then Satan comes in with drugs, alcohol, immorality to counterfeit true joy. That brings people joy and relaxation in the flesh. So he counterfeits that. Then he goes on to bring in the process of imitation. Another Jesus, and yet his name will be called Jesus Christ. Another gospel, another Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. The imitational process. We're saved by works and not by grace. Galatians 1, 6 to 8. Removing people from the pure gospel of grace. Imitation. Then he's the author of many forms of unrighteousness, as 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 teaches. Unrighteousness is anything short of divine perfection. So a man living in human good is unrighteous. A man living in self-righteousness is unrighteous. And 
The unrighteous do not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. But these were his imitations. He wanted men to be established in their own righteousness in Romans 10, 3, to glorify the flesh so the flesh could glory and compare themselves with others and enter into relevant righteousness to cause division among believers and to take the glory away from the gift of grace and the beautiful, precious provision of Calvary's blood atonement. Satan said, okay, God says it's a free gift by grace through faith. But he entered into opposition to that by bringing in a system where they would start out in the spirit but end up in the energy of the flesh to perfect themselves in Galatians 3. He went against the grace of the penny being given on the 11th hour. Opposition to the gift of God. Opposition to the grace of God. So we have counterfeit process, imitational program, and now tremendous opposition. Then he went into a program called the Wandering Mind Cycle, where he would bring in the wandering mind as far back as Jeremiah 48, 10 through 13, and 2 Peter 3, 17. Planao, and this word, planao, is really a being led astray by the delusion of a wandering mind. P-L-A-N-A-O. So Satan comes in and makes your mind wander. That's a deep work of Satan. This will happen to you over and over again in the class. A lack of concentration. A lack of consecration. Consecration and concentration. Why? Because of one thing why this keeps happening. A lack of concentration does more to promote Satan's kingdom when you're dealing with invisible supernatural spirits, when you're dealing, when we're dealing with demons, it does more than any other thing to bring in delusion. I'll guarantee you behind every problem you have, and I have, is a lack of concentration. It's interesting to watch professional sports the people that have concentration make it. Those that do not have concentration under pressure, just as good are athletes, amazing athletes, but just cannot concentrate. The same in closing as a salesman. Those that are very good under pressure become the greatest representatives of their companies. The same with pastor teachers those that can concentrate with God under pressure and do what the remnant was doing here, thinking every thought through thoroughly with God. So concentration makes me experience academic discipline. It builds my capacity for receptivity, my perception for awareness, my ability through the impartation of grace to transfer knowledge into experience, to fill up my frontal lobe with the culmination of divine viewpoint. This, these are the things concentration does. Concentration when you're attacked, when you're tempted, when you're persecuted. Concentration in marital problems. Concentration in the difficult single life at times. Concentration. And this always builds me up in God as I concentrate under the government of grace and through the judicial sentence of mercy rejoicing against judgment. Now, one of the most difficult things you're going to have this year is concentration. You're going to be okay for a few weeks. But when the pressure comes and financial challenges come and sickness comes and problems come, you will start saying, well, I've had to miss lately. But concentration, for the most part, in many cases, you can start learning right now. People become wanderers of the mind, and, and where do they go? I mean, I, I mean, 
if you're going to let your mind wander, you're going to let your mind wander the next thing you do when you get married, when you go out and get a position, go to college, whatever you do, are you going to let your mind wander? This is a deep work of Satan, making your mind wander. I've always been amazed at the 48th chapter of Jeremiah when the deep work of Satan brings wandering minds with wandering minds. You'll find that if two people smoke, they'll find each other when they don't know each other smokes. It's amazing. If somebody doesn't want to go to church, he will have an intimate fellowship with somebody else that doesn't want to go to church. Just as sure as you're breathing. Years later, well, I don't go to church, but I love the body, they'll say. Wandering spiritual minds. Having a rapport with wandering spiritual minds. People sometimes, isolated cases, will go out in the bar rooms and be on drugs to two in the morning. Yes, people attend this church occasionally do that, unfortunately. But Satan gathers them together for a relationship. They have a rapport. It's not around the Bible or Jesus Christ. It's around visiting various baths from 12 to 3 in the morning. So I've heard. And so I've been told and I've been given their names. Well, these kind of people will come into church and they love our grace messages. But when we get into something like last night, they are shocked. And they just look to the floor. Very discontented when you get into the sin issue. Why? They lack concentration. They have a wandering mind. So when they do hear the word of God, they are not made aware of divine viewpoint. There is no awareness. There is no epinosis. There is no transference of truth into experiential culmination of divine viewpoint in the mind, in the heart, in the memory center. And consequently, we have the satanic depth of making people wander in their mind instead of concentrating or being occupied with Christ. You know you have to concentrate on drugs in order to go back on them. You have to concentrate on boredom in order to be bored. You have to concentrate on negativity in order to get negative. Everything you do it took your concentration. You say, but I'm confused. Yes, but you, you made sure that that could happen. God protected you from confusion. But you wouldn't accept a simple statement of a leader a simple class, a simple thing from the Word of God, you refuse to accept it. Consequently, you enter into periods of confusion. Well, these are some of the deep things of Satan. Now, plain E, P-L-A-N, the long E, in 2 Peter 3.17, you hook up with other personalities who go astray instead of growing in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You attach yourself to other individuals that go astray. In other words, you have to have a support group to do a good job in your sin. Now, this is some of the deep things that Satan does to corrupt the mind. Then he takes a person into the next phase, deception. He uses bait in Ephesians 4.14. And he uses this bait to begin to entice people into deception. And they begin to cheat against truth. And Satan beguiles them as one who is cheated. And they begin to deviate and digress through the deep work of Satan. And they cheat against mandates. They cheat against provisions. They cheat against precise light. And then they'll tell you that they're perfectly okay. It's called Operation Early Deception. They enter into false impressions. From false impressions, they go into false appearance and false statements under the wrong influence. This is deception. 
And it starts out in the atmosphere without any people around. False impressions, false appearance, false statements under the wrong influence. That's deception. Then deception in the deep work of Satan enters into conspiracy. Conspiracy is the plot of many people to overthrow truth when you look at it from divine viewpoint. There may be a proper conspiracy that is expressed in the kingdom of God in divine warfare. But uh, conspiracy is secret planning that is unbiblical and illegal when people act together, breathe together, unite together to plot and betray. It's the culmination of deception. When Satan, secret things, are things hidden from the view of, of people. He inculcates error and leads people into confrontations with his intellect. Satan wants to confront you and I with his supernatural intellect. The next thing that Satan does in the deep things of Satan is to tell us that we have arrived. Nobody can ever teach us. We have had all this experience when we've never had Bible college training. We've never studied exegetically. We have truly never consistently prepared historically. We don't know categorical doctrine, and yet Satan whispers, you know that, you've arrived. It's called the deep work of Satan in the pride of life. I've heard that before, and yet 1 Corinthians 8 says we do not know a single thing as we ought to know it, and knowledge puffeth up, but love sets us free. Well, that's another deep, deep work of Satan, such as he used in Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, in his superiority over God, and the Corinthian church used it against Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 and many other times, and he approached them sarcastically in the spirit. The next deep work of Satan is this. The cross is foolishness. Next, signs and wonders means you're spiritual. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. The next thing is you don't have to take up your cross daily. They're trying to brainwash you. That is undue influence. What's this business? Take up your cross daily. They belong to the shepherd's movement. Well, nobody here belongs to the shepherd movement, never have and this totally repudiates it. But that's the accusation in order to smear your character and to take advantage of your reputation. So that's the deep work of Satan. The next thing Satan does, and I want you to understand it in a new way this morning, is he defiles people. Now the word for defile is kainoo here that I'm thinking of, and it means to make common and familiar the sacred opportunities and to make them just plain ordinary. Kainoo, the word for defile. This is a deep work of Satan. The manifestation of God's presence has been overwhelming. You go out in the car and the first people are under the manifestation of the anointing. They're very fervently involved in deep impressions of God. You say, well, where's my car? Where's the child? See, there's nothing to it. You're making the sacred ordinary. Or you come in here and, the, and everybody's been singing and worshiping God and there's a phenomenal spirit of worship. The song leader and the music have brought us into a great spirit of worship. And you start the yawning process known Operation Wandering by Yawning. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having a good yawn. Every single one of us have days we yawn. That's not sinful. But if it's done every service as a habit, then it obviously becomes satanic. The influence is atmospheric if it's a practice all the time. Otherwise, a good yawn is good for us. Now, 
But the whole purpose is you didn't get in. You didn't worship God in spirit and truth during the song service. Your mind was as wandering as far as away as what you're going to do for dinner, what's going to happen tomorrow or tonight. And your mind starts wandering because you or anybody that does that is being deceived by a deep inner work of Satan. All right? Calling divine good evil and calling evil good, divine good. Isaiah 40, verse 20. This is when a ministry preaches the gospel. A ministry has a beautiful church. A ministry has outreaches galore. The people overall are fervent. The outreach is international. And they go forth year after year and somebody calls them evil. Satanic says they're off. They don't check Matthew 7, 16, by their fruit you'll know them. Matthew 7, 20, the only way they can inspect is inspect the fruit. Otherwise, let God handle it. They don't do that. So they call what is divinely speaking good through grace evil, meaning it's a part of Satan's government. And the things that are evil out there, they call good. Well... Of course, the Bible says evil will come upon their children. So if they want to do that, that's fine in Proverbs. But nevertheless, that's up to them. But that's a deep work of Satan to twist it. Ex-members are good. Church people that are winning souls are evil. Ex-members that do this in all the evangelical churches around the country, they're good. This man, Rokos, who got caught with his hand in the cookie jar soliciting male prostitutes in the police record that religious freedom gave us, he's good. He's good to the media. It's all right, he's good. Who calls him good? Satan. What's the Bible call him? A pervert. They call him a pervert. He's perverted with all of his clothespins, and I won't go into it. But he's the president of Can National. That's all he is, president of a national organization. But he's good. They don't want any information on him from religious freedom. We don't get involved in it, but religious freedom does. But he's good. And people that have go down in the uh, inner city three and a half years and minister to the prostitutes, the precious children in the inner city, they're bad. You getting the point now? Do you understand what the deep work of Satan means? The deep work of Satan, as the late Bishop Sheen said, is when people in your own, he called it parish, we'll call it ministry, when people in your own ministry betray you. He says that's the deepest work of Satan, is when somebody knows your ministry, knows you, knows your love, knows your service, knows your compassion, and they use being on the inside to plot satanically to destroy you in a support group. He said that Absalom, Judas, even Peter, who was saved, this was a deep, deep work of Satan, says the late, watch, uh, says the late Bishop Sheen. And he's very right. He says, no one knows how to destroy God's work like leaders do who used to be working with the ministry. All right, that's a deep work of Satan. Here's another deep work of Satan. Taking the grace of God and turning it into lasciviousness, Jude 4, saying that we're under grace, therefore, if I want to go out once in three or four weeks and sin, it's all right. That's a deep work of Satan. Taking the grace of God and turning it into lasciviousness. Anti-Nomanism, Titus 1.16, professing to know God's character, but in production of human life deny him. That's anti-Nomanism. That's a very deep, deep work of Satan. It's all right to go out and live for the devil as long as you're under grace. No, that's not what grace is for. Grace is a precious, sacred thing. We couldn't survive if we weren't under grace. But we don't come under grace so we can continue in sin. Romans 6.2, God forbid. Romans 6.15, God forbid. 
How can we that are dead to sin and positional truth experience sin by application of free volition, says Romans 6. No, it is very vital that we understand that's a deep work of Satan to take the grace of God and turn it into lasciviousness. Here's another thing in the deep work of Satan. A person becomes subjective and thinks they have a corner on everybody's life. They critique people, and they do not let the people stand or fall before God. Listen, let everybody stand or fall before God. Romans 14, 4, Romans 14, 7, 8, and 9. Let us live unto the Lord. Let us die unto the Lord. And outside of the table of organization and loving your brother as a dear friend and wanting to help, that's different. That's different because your motive is wonderful. Your motive is restoration. Your motive is correction. And that's precious, rebuking a friend that way. That's in order. But other than that, you don't critique people. And it's a deep work of the Pharisees for them to critique and you know what? I found this out when I've been off in that area in my 38 years as a Christian. I found out that the things I thought I knew, I didn't know at all. I had all these perceptions, and I understood, and I knew just what was going on, and many times I blew it right up to 80% and got so humiliated and embarrassed when I found out the truth, I wanted to put my head in the sand and keep it there. I was no match to satanic sight. I was no match for invisible warfare with my great knowledge of the New Testament, memorizing the whole New Testament. I was no match. My subjectivity was wrong. It was sinful. When I knew more of the Bible than I ever knew in my life, I was at the worst end with God judging people. I had to get on my knees and take a long list and repent and write letters years ago. I judged Billy Graham. I judged them all. I was professional at it because I knew the Bible so well. I mean, I had categorical doctrine that could run them all. None of them were any good. But that's what my peers around me in the city I went to the, to the pastoral, they taught me to be a good Pharisee, and I honored them because I was new. And I knew more of the scriptures, to be honest with you, than they did. So I really did a good job as a young <laughs> novice. Then I had to repent. Then I realized in those early years that some of my judging was getting me back so I would stop judging. It was painful. Finally, yes, Lord, I judged him, and I'm sorry. I name it, and I repent, and I hate it. Fine. How many understand that? But that was a deep work of Satan because I had memorized and labored over memorizing the New Testament and could memorize it easy. It came easy to me. And I could memorize categories. And I understood them. What a weapon to use on people. My God. So sickening as I think it over, I want to vomit. <laughs> Can't you see how that can be such, I mean, a deep work of Satan? All right. Now, to judge situations, therefore, when you only have part of the truth. How do you like that one? How many times have you and I, be honest with me now, please, heard things about people? I have, and fallen right in the trap, especially if it's a close friend. I've heard one side and I form an honest, subjective opinion for, for months. Never hear the other side. Never occurred to me that Proverbs tells me to hear the other side before I think it's... <laughs> Ever done that? And I'm already on a side before I know a thing from the other party. This is why I get so angry at some of these councils across the nation. When I used to refer people to psychologists, I used to get so mad, they always, for the most part, would take the side of the first person that came to them. And they never exercised reality therapy. 
making people face reality of objectivity. You know what I've learned since I've been growing up some? Do not listen to one side until both sides can be presented at the same time. Otherwise, my old nature could get in with so much deceit. And right away, I'm in your corner because I've known you for years, so whatever you say must be right. And furthermore, if you can put it over professionally, you'll win and influence the person. If you're a good talker, and the other guy happens to be very quiet. He's, he's guilty by us, you know, already by your judgment. So let's remember that listening to one side and making a judgment and becoming a part of a support group is indeed a deep work of Satan in our age. Now, The last thing I want to mention is the deep work of Satan. And these things are very important because warfare is one of the things we know about least than anything else, less than anything else. And here it is. Failing the grace of God. Hebrews 12, 15. Are frustrating the grace of God, not only by the law in Galatians 2, 21b, but failing the grace of God and frustrating the grace of God is a deep work of Satan. All right, let me illustrate it. Here's a person that has been in hypocrisy. They have failed off and on for years. Then finally, the Holy Spirit comes through. He always comes through, but you know what I mean. They let him. They listen to him. Then they really, truly get right. Now they're, they, they don't commit that sin anymore. Overall, there's a marvelous change. There's a transforming mind going on in a beautiful way. Now this is what happens. The guilt complex continues to pound them. They cannot grow now because they cannot accept the grace of God for themselves and they fail the grace of God they don't fail by sinning they fail the grace of God and they receive the grace of God in vain in 2 Corinthians 6 1 and 2 and they frustrate it probably one of the most beautiful things about Hebrews 11 when you read those people that are heroes of faith is most of them miserably fail and miserably went down under and isolated it, accepted forgiveness, forgot it, and moved on. Just like they never did it, just like the Bible says. These people were heroes of faith. Not heroes of, of their life, but heroes of faith, believing in Christ and growing in grace and knowledge of a person. How many understand that? So, what a deep work of Satan it is when no one can function or adjust outside of grace in Romans 5, 2 and Hebrews 13, 9. What an amazing thing to get us to fail the grace of God and to be second-rate citizens. It affects our prayer life. It affects our love for each other. It affects our family, our marriage, whatever, because we fail the grace of God and we frustrate it. All right? Now, the next verse says... Hold on to what you have until I come. Now that passage is dealing with your spiritual growth with doctrine. And I'll close by exegeting it. Now, but that which you have already, hold fast. It's a present active indicative of echo. And it's hold fast is grateo. Grateo is an aorist active imperative from grata, strength. Use the strength of the word of God to con once and for all produce the action of honoring a mandate in the imperative mood. Uphold, keep in operation, never surrender anything that you have. Hold fast, grateo in the aorist active imperative, 
Enjoy God's strength as doctrine operates freely in you in the spirit until Jesus comes back. Now, God is saying, listen, you may not always be able to grow. Maybe you're at a place right now when you don't think you can go forward, but one thing you can do is not go backward. You don't have to go backward. Still maintain where you are. Maintain truth. Maintain your obedience. Maintain your prayer life, even if you don't feel good at all. Maintain your fellowship. Maintain your faith. Maybe you're not growing. Maybe you're not going forward, but maintain what you've got and guard your heart in that. Next time we'll go into the overcoming verses of Thyatira. Father, dismiss us in Jesus' name. Amen.